Welcome again to the Word of God ministry coming to you from St. John's Lutheran Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I am Pastor Tom Clocker, and as always, I thank you for tuning in. And I always trust that God will bring you a, a blessing through the message. It's not me, but it's the Word of God, and where the Word of God goes forth, the Holy Spirit is there to bless. And so I pray that God will give each of you uh, during our time together the blessing of faith that you need. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in your word. Thank you as we continue to celebrate the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. I pray for each who are listening to this message that no matter where they are, you would bring them a blessing, uh, that you would encourage their hearts and um, give them a joy and reassurance of salvation through the good news that Christ has risen from the dead. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen. And as always, we <clears throat> spend our time together in the name of the one true God, the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We are continuing to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus this weekend. And so I have three readings, and all of them uh, have to do with people who met Jesus after he had risen from the dead. So the first one is taken from uh, Luke 24, verses 9 to 12, and this is where Mary Magdalene and Mary came. They had seen Jesus, they had seen the empty tomb, and they came and told the disciples, but the disciples did not believe what the women told them. So when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others, not just the 11 immediate disciples, but others who were there. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But the apostles did not believe the women because their words seemed to be like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb, and bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Our second reading is taken from the same chapter, Luke chapter 24, just continuing in verse 13. And Luke tells us an instance here after Jesus rose from the dead where he met two of his disciples traveling along the road. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village, two disciples, called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still and their faces became downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked them. Things about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. But the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place and in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. So they came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women have said, but they did not see Jesus. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken the Old Testament. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And so beginning with Moses and through all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself. This is the word of the Lord. And our holy gospel is the very familiar gospel for the Sunday after Easter and that is when Jesus appears to doubting Thomas. John 20, beginning in verse 24, 
reading through verse 31. Now Thomas, who was also known as Didymus, was one of the twelve, but he was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Now Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book, but these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We will be reading the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We got enough snacks. <laughs> Spread out, everybody. Spread out. Then he teach for a few days, and then he had the Lord's Supper. Do you know about the picture? You know, you see the painting where Jesus is in the middle of the table, and then he has some disciples sitting on that side and disciples over on that side. Well, one of the disciples betrayed him, right? And that's Judas Iscariot. And he went and he told them, hey, I know how to get Jesus, and uh, I can betray him for you. And they gave him 30 pieces of silver, right? And uh, so he got betrayed, and uh, he had, so that was on Thursday. So on Friday, he has to go to court because uh, one of the disciples had betrayed him. And so he goes before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate says, well, we have a tradition here. We let one person go. Uh, one uh, person gets to go free. The other person has to say, so we had a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. And when he asked the people, which one do you want me to set free? They said, Barabbas. We want Barabbas. He said, well, what do, we, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And they said, crucify him. Crucify him. So that's how he got crucified. And then that's how we know Jesus took our sins on the cross and he died on the cross. What happened to him after he died? They took him down off the cross and put him in a tomb, right? All right, so that Friday after he died on the cross, they take, took him down and put him in the tomb. We'll say this egg represents Jesus' tomb. And he's in the tomb, right? So then Saturday, Saturday comes along. But Saturday is their Sabbath. That's a holy day. They can't do any work. So Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, 
want, had some spices and of course they wanted to put that on the body because in those days that's what they had to do because you know if somebody dies or if you have a dead body they get smelly right so they wanted to come to the tomb and put spices on but they couldn't that day because it was Saturday so Jesus still in the tomb right then Sunday morning comes along and early in the morning Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James come to the tomb and they get to the tomb, but the tomb is open. It's open and it's empty. <laughs> oh, the tomb is empty. He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right? He's gone. He's gone. It's because it's it's already gone. It's empty. So, all right. So, but he's gone, so that gives us the hope. And then he came back, right? And he came back and appeared to Mary just outside of the tomb. And he showed that he was alive again. So even though he was dead, that's our hope. And this is the best day of the whole year, right? Because Jesus rose from the grave. And that gives us hope that we'll be risen someday too. Okay, so I wanted to read the account out of John. Okay. Well, hang on, I'll read the comment. Pastor read each of each of the this, um, four gospels has this account about Jesus in the tomb. Okay, and uh, he read the one out of Matthew. I'm going to read the one out of John. Okay, so you guys listen to this story. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter, and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, who would that be? John, okay, because he's the one that wrote the book of John. And, and said, they have taken the Lord uh, out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple, which was John, started for the tomb, and both were running, so they kind of had a little race going on. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at, at, in at the strips of linen lying there and did not go in. Then Simon Peter, you know how Simon was always bold and wanted to jump out of the boat and walk on the water and everything. Simon, who had behind, been behind him, he arrived and went into the tomb. He, he saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who was John, who had reached the tomb first, he went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples, what did they do? They went back to their homes. But Mary, she stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not recognize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to the Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Then Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So they, they had left the tomb before, all, before everything had happened. There was already, there was two uh, angels in there that were telling her, hey, he's gone. And you're right. Without the empty tomb, we'd be stuck in the grave too, wouldn't we? But someday we'll be with Jesus when we die and we go to be to heaven with him. So, so let's pray, okay? I'll pray and then you guys pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father.
Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the empty tomb. You have risen from the dead. Thank you for giving us this hope. Thank you for giving us this hope. That we will someday be with you also. That we will someday be with you also. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. So I have I have two different treats here for you. You can have a sucker if you want a sucker, or you can have one of these Rice Krispie treats. Rice Krispie treats. No, I want some normal ones. This is normal. This is normal. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And the church continues to celebrate the good news of Easter. And we celebrate the good news of Easter 52 weeks out of the year because it's the resurrection of Christ that affirms everything that God had promised to us in our Savior when the Savior was to come. In today's world, zombies, which seem to be everywhere, are often called the living dead. Of course, though, when the Bible talks about the dead living, when the Bible talks about rising from the dead, it says something drastically different in mind. The Bible doesn't talk about the living dead. The Bible talks about the dead living. Amen? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for the gift of the good news again, that Christ has risen from the grave. May that bring us peace and assurance that we also will rise to go and be with him who has gone to prepare a place for us. Bless our time in the word today, for Jesus' sake. Amen. As you heard in our readings on Easter, Paul says that if there's no resurrection, then our faith is in vain. So is the reality, the true fact of the resurrection, critical to our Christian faith. Absolutely. Paul says without the resurrection, our faith has no, basically, no foundation. If death could hold Jesus, if death got victory over Jesus, death would have a hold on us. Death would have victory on us. But Christ conquered death when he rose from the grave. And now those of us who are in Christ will rise with him to live forever in glory. So it is a truth that the resurrection is absolutely critical to our faith. Most Easter's we are bombarded with national media questioning did Christ really raise from the dead? Magazine articles, television shows, and so forth. And they ask things like, where and when and why did the Christian church come up with this idea, this resurrection idea? Well, where was outside Jerusalem? When was a little over 2,000 years ago? And why is because Christ really did rise from the dead. Christ is risen he is risen indeed. There are many historical evidences of Christ's resurrection. There were hundreds who saw him after Easter and wrote and told others about it. The Romans and other early historians write about the resurrection of Jesus. They write around the empty tomb, but they're puzzled over it and try to explain it away. The Jewish leaders couldn't produce Christ's dead body to squash the truth that he had risen from the dead. If that body had been anywhere accessible to them, they would have gone to make sure that they could grab it and show somebody and prove that Christ had not risen from the dead. That never happened. And then also the thousands over the years who've been willing to die for a truth, a truth about a risen living Savior. Now, despite what Scripture says, if Christ is not risen, our faith is useless. Despite that truth, the reality of the empty tomb itself doesn't make any difference. 
How can a Christian pastor say such a thing? Well, before you get too upset, let me illustrate my point. Let's go back to the first Easter. Now, Jesus has already risen from the dead. The empty tomb is now a reality. And for the folks back then, that was a reality that they could go see. It was a historical fact. It happened. Jesus has risen from the dead, and the tomb is empty. Now let's look at four other scenes from that time of Easter and the days following. Scene one is Mary Magdalene and the women who loved Jesus, having gone to the tomb, They've gone to grieve and to anoint the body. And in John 20 says, Mary stood outside the empty tomb weeping. She stood next to the empty tomb crying. So despite the reality of the empty tomb and the fact of the empty tomb, Mary is still filled with sorrow. See number two, I just read, the two followers of Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus a few days after Easter. The Bible says they had already heard about the resurrection. They had already heard the story of an empty tomb, but it says these two followers were downcast and sad and confused. Scene three, the disciples are all hiding in fear. The women come rushing in. They bring the message that Christ is risen. They tell the disciples that they have actually seen the empty tomb, and yet nothing changes. The Bible says to the disciples it all seemed like nonsense, and so their fear remained with them. And then scene four. The one disciple who was missing, Thomas, now joined the group. The others tell Thomas about the risen Lord and the empty tomb, for Peter and John had gone down to see it for themselves. But Thomas is still filled with doubt. Four scenes. The resurrection had already happened. The empty tomb was already an historical and verifiable fact. It was real. It had happened. But yet Mary is still crying. The two disciples on the road are still downcast and confused. The disciples are still filled with fear. And Thomas still has his doubts. The fact of the resurrection made no difference whatsoever. The empty tomb made no difference. Not until. Not until what? until these people personally met the risen and living Savior. The tomb was already empty. It was a fact, and Mary was crying. She was crying until she's heading back and meets the risen Jesus. And then her tears are dried, and she runs the west of the way back, filled with great joy, to tell the disciples. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they are downcast and confused until, until they meet the risen Jesus. And then they understood, and then he explained to them the true meaning of life and of what had just happened. And then they understood the love of God, and they realized what their eternal future will be. And no longer sad and confused, the Bible says that their hearts were set afire. The resurrection has happened. The empty tomb was there. They heard the message. But until the ten disciples still continued to hide in fear and guilt until the risen Jesus appeared to them in that room. Now they were no longer filled with fear, and the disciples went out boldly after that to proclaim Jesus despite the dangers. Thomas was filled with doubts. He still doubted even when other witnesses told him about the empty tomb. But then the risen Jesus appears to Thomas. See my hand, see my side. Thomas proclaims, Jesus proclaims to Thomas words of assurance and faith. And Thomas replies, Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. Just as the New Testament says, the reality of the resurrection is absolutely critical. It had to happen. That's a foundation for our faith. 
The empty tomb is vitally important, but it's still only half the question. Now that Jesus has risen from the dead, now that the grave is empty, now that the fact of the resurrection is established, there is a second equally critical question for you and for me. Have you met the risen Lord Jesus? Now that the grave is empty, now that the fact of the resurrection is established, the fact of the resurrection did not become a blessing and did not become life-changing power to Mary, Peter, Thomas, or the disciples until they personally met the risen Savior. They needed the presence of the risen Jesus in their hearts and in their lives, and so do we. There are countless people who, like Mary, are sad and grieved over loved ones who have passed away. There are millions, like the disciples, living their lives in fear and fear of death. And the empty tomb is no comfort and the resurrection is no blessing unless they meet and know the risen Jesus. There are many, like the two disciples, on the way to Emmaus. They're confused about religion confused about life. They don't know why they're here, and they don't know where they're going, and the resurrection will help, not help them walk their journey of life unless they walk that journey with the risen Jesus. There are a lot of doubting Thomases, people who are cynical and questioning and unbelieving, and they will never believe unless they have an encounter with the risen Jesus. Churches around the world continue to be filled with joy and celebration, filled with people whose lives have been forever changed, filled with people who are no longer afraid of life or death, filled with people who know why they're here and who know where they're going, filled with people set free from guilt by the complete forgiveness of their past, filled with people not because they saw an empty tomb, filled not because someone could prove to them the fact of the resurrection. Our churches are filled week after week with people who have personally, through faith, met the risen Jesus. Have you met him? It's the most eternally important question in your life. So how do we meet Jesus? How do we know Jesus personally? How can we see the risen Savior? Only through eyes of faith. Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet still believe. Even though you and I did not stand on that hill on Good Friday, faith still sees the cross and believes that the one who was dying there was paying for our sin. Though you and I did not stand at the empty tomb, faith sees the stone rolled away and believes that Jesus did conquer death so that we can live forever. And though you and I have never seen the risen Jesus in the flesh, faith believes that Jesus meets us and lives beside us each day. Through these eyes of faith, most of you have met the risen Savior. And you are blessed to know that God forgives you. That the risen Jesus wants to be your closest friend during this journey of life. The New Testament says Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's not simply a matter of facts about the resurrection it's not simply a matter of proving the resurrection. And while those things are true, their blessing, their power, their eternal life comes to you when by faith you meet the risen Jesus in your heart. Trust your life and trust your eternal soul to the Savior who loves you so much that he conquered death and the grave to be with you forever. Amen. Let's pray. 
Lord, there are so many blessings to be found in Jesus. Forgiveness, guarantee of eternal life, uh, a promise of strength in his presence for each day in this life. So many, many blessings tied up in Jesus. But those blessings are only bestowed upon those who love and trust in Jesus as their risen Savior. Those of us and those who hear my voice today, who do trust in Jesus as their risen Savior, you are incredibly blessed. You are blessed beyond nearly everyone else on the globe because God has revealed that to you and God has blessed you with that gift of faith by which you'll live forever. For those of you who have not yet met the risen Jesus because you have not yet accepted him for who he is or trusted in him for your salvation, I pray that the words planted today would be seeds that would blossom to fruit in your life, fruit in the blessing of the walking this life with Jesus, and eternal fruit that you might receive eternal life as well. Lord, make it so for all who hear your word, for Jesus is worthy of the worship of every man, woman, and child, and all of creation. Amen. Join with me as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray while he was here on earth. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, dear friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and fill you and your loved ones with his peace that passes all human understanding. Amen. Would just like to remind everyone that here at St. John's Lutheran School, which is a part of our ministry, uh, we are enrolling for the coming school year. So if you live in the area, uh, here in the Winston-Salem area, if you have children or know of children, uh, grandchildren, who would be blessed by a, a safe, small classroom environment, um, where the kids get a lot more personal attention and teaching, but also a place where every day they will pray and learn about Jesus more and more and grow in his faith. This school has blessed thousands of children over the years, and we give God praise and thanksgiving for that. But we also pray that maybe you know a child that would be blessed uh, to come and, and, and be educated, get a quality education, be safe, but also to hear every day of the week how much God loves them in Jesus. So please recommend our school. Uh, there are scholarships available um, uh, often. Uh, some of our parents pay very little. North Carolina has scholarships to support private education. If you have any questions or any uh, concerns, please call the school uh, numbers on our website and uh, they'll be happy to answer your questions. And I would ask that the rest of you would pray for our school. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's not easy to manage a school um, just in, with one congregation and there are great challenges to it, but we have a fantastic staff. Many of them have been with us for many years uh, and um, we have a, a, a fantastic principal, wonderful families, um, but all that happens because we have a lot of people who pray for our school. So I'm asking you to join along with them and in your prayer time, just pray for St. John's and all the children at St. John's who are learning about Jesus. Thank you if you do so. Amen.